Welcome, everyone. So uh, today's panel is um, Do It Yourself, Indie Game Devs from Napkin to Profitability. Uh, the goal of this panel is to um, explore the opportunities in indie game development. Um, it's a very quickly changing industry. Uh, I know where we are in Vancouver. Um, a lot of jobs have been shed, uh, companies closing. Um, and on the other side of it, also a lot of new opportunities through digital distribution, all the channels through iOS, through um, Congregate, uh, different websites like that. So it seems like a, a good opportunity now for people to take a look at um, you know, what they might want to get out of this industry, whether they're looking for a job or whether or not there's just the burning desire to do your own thing. So, um, so we wanna, I, I, we've got a bunch of panelists here from Vancouver. Um, we're all part of the full indie meetup um, in Vancouver. And so uh, there's probably a couple hundred of us and um, it's pretty well attended meetings. About a hundred people come up every month. And uh, these panelists in particular are really interesting because um, they're each working on making a sustainable um, indie game development company. So uh, there's a lot of people who are hobbyists who are kind of dabbling in different games, but um, each of the panelists here today are really committed to making indie game development um, their livelihood. And so I think that's uh, being able to kind of pick their brains and, and see how they're doing it um, will hopefully give you guys you know, a bit of knowledge and uh, confidence to do this yourself if that's what you're interested in. So uh, I'm going to just uh, intro each of us and then we'll get started. So um, my, uh, my name is Mark Baxter. I'm um, VP of product and co-founder of a company called Vividy Labs. Um, I founded a couple companies uh, up in Vancouver and um, definitely have an entrepreneurial spirit. And I've, I've been involved in the industry for about a dozen years. And I just, I like the idea of kind of taking ownership of what I do and being able to do the things that I want to do. Um, so I'm going to just uh, pass the panel down to Jake. So if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Can everyone hear me okay back there? Good. So hi, I'm Jake Burkett. Um, I run and own Grey Alien Games, which is just me. So, you know, that's the way it is when you're indie. Um, I went indie in 2005 after making business software for nine years. You know, I kind of had enough and always made games as a hobby. Uh, I made a, a whole bunch of casual games. Then I got hired by Big Fish Games in Vancouver. They, they made a small office there. Did a couple of years there, made a Facebook game amongst other things as part of a team. And, um, you know, these are some of my kind of screenshots. I also like to make free mini games just to keep me in practice, you know, like at game jams and things like that. So, so I've made seven kind of casual games now, and, and what's going to be interesting is, is, is what's next, I guess. So that's me. So maybe we move to Ola. Um, hi, my name is Ola. I, uh, since 2008, I've been running a dress-up games website, and I w actually have a science background, but I just started making games on the side for fun. Um, and then I started getting a lot of traffic and get got really popular, so I... Um, I've been doing it now full time for a year because it actually pays the bills um, and yeah, it's great. Uh, my name is Shane Neville. I am that guy that started off in QA and worked my way up through the game industry. Um, in the past 15 years, I've worked on Need for Speed. I was the producer of Company of Heroes. And two years ago, I was managing a game studio for Longtail Studios out on the east coast of Canada. Uh, if you don't, they're not familiar with Longtail Studios, it's kind of a sister company to Ubisoft, and it was started up by one of the Guimau brothers, uh, Gerard Guimau. Um, about two years ago, I had a kind of, well, three years ago, I guess, I had kind of crisis of faith and decided that I needed to pursue my dreams, that I'd often wanted to go independent, and the emerging digital revolution was really changing things. So at the start of 2010, uh, I sold my house, put all the money in the bank, moved back to Vancouver from the East Coast, and started working on Ninja Robot Dinosaur, which is my independent game company. Uh, I made a game, uh, here, next slide. Uh, my first game was Ray Arden's Science Ninja, which uh, was a game where you are a science ninja, which is the best thing ever, and you run around and you jump on dinosaurs. It's a speedrun slash game. It got sponsored by Armor Games. Average review scores of between 7.5 and 9, depending on the portal. It got front page on Newgrounds, front page on Congregate, and of course, Armor put it on the front page because they sponsored it. Um, I started that business with the idea that free flash games would be a really awesome way to make money if you sold merchandise. 
And so I had this big, like, I'm going to get a bunch of T-shirts printed up, and I'm going to sell the T-shirts in every portal, and I'll make a ton of cash. So I've got 2.2 million or 2.3 million plays and two T-shirts sold. So that was a gigantic failure, and it was kind of a big impact to me. So um, I have a family, so I started doing some consulting. So right now I'm a full-time dad, part-time consultant, part-time indie game developer, but I'm profitable. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'm going to ask a series of questions today um, just to kind of get a sense of kind of what made them um, go from, you know, whatever they were doing previously to being an indie, indie game developer, uh, talking a bit about um, some of the opportunities that are open, how to deal with, um, you know, things like funding and distribution and stuff like that, and some challenges. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, making the switch. Um, so, you know, each of you guys were doing something, you know, before your indie game stuff, and um, so the question is, is, is what made you decide to go indie? Um, what, what was your motivation to do this? Maybe I'll start. I've actually made the switch twice. Um, so the first time was, in, as I said, in 2005. I've been programming games since the age of eight, and it, was, it had been a hobby for many years. And I was making business software and making a game in my spare time, staying up to like 4 a.m. making this game. And I just realized I was getting ill from like no sleep and, and, and actually to finish this game, I thought I need to go full time. And you know, I was getting tired of the business software thing. So I decided to go full time indie. And, um, but at that time I was making a, um, an action game, like a side scrolling kung fu beat em up, you know, kind of sounds quite indie. But back then there was no Steam, no iOS, you know, no channels to actually market a game like that. So that's why I went into casual games, which proved to be a good business model. Um, it was very tough, but I'm sure we'll come on to that later. Uh, and then I got hired by Big Fish Games, and that was, uh, got me into Canada and was a, a good educational experience. But you know, in the end, um, I think that indie calling came back, and I just needed to, to do my own thing again. And so that's, that's why I did it the second time, but I did it more sensibly with money in the bank and stuff like that, which we can, we can talk about later. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I had always made games kind of for fun, but I don't know why it never occurred to me that I could do it for a living. My, my parents are both artists, and they always, like, said, whatever you do, like, don't be an artist. So I always tried to be responsible and got a science degree, but <laughs> I basically, as soon as I saw, like, I realized, like, wow, I can do this for a living. It was, like, that was really all it took. So then I just, like, worked hard on, on making it happen. Yeah, for me, it was... Um I, I asked myself another question. If you had $20 million and money was no concern, what would you do all day? And a lot of people are like, oh, I'd hang out on a beach, I'd travel the world. What I would do is I would sit in the basement and make experimental flash games. That, and that was my goal for five years. And that was always the dream to have enough money to do that. Well, suddenly it became a viable business model. And so that kind of lined it up. So I, c I think I could be happy doing this for the rest of my life. Oh, I, I also want to add that um, I'm, a, I'm a dad, I've got two kids. and there was a point when I was doing the business software and I was traveling all over the country in England and, um, and I realized, well, I actually want to spend some more time with my kids. And so being indie allowed me to kind of be at home and see, see them a bit more. And the other thing was I was making millions of pounds for someone else. And I was like, I need to be doing this for myself. I haven't actually made millions of pounds for myself yet. <laughs> but, you know. but you've seen your kids. Yeah, I have seen my kids. I've had a good time. So can, you can do that next year. Yeah, that's right, Mark. So uh, for how about for a bit of context for these guys? Maybe you could just um, talk a little bit about um, what roles that you guys take. You know, we wear a lot of hats, right? So artist, designer, sound. Um, so I'm just curious what each of you guys do in your own indie development. Um, I do everything except for audio. Um, my background is in production and project management and design. Uh, but I taught myself how to program a year and a half ago, and I've always dabbled in art, but I've never done anything serious. So I, I've just been doing a lot of work. The greatest benefit of working in the industry for 15 years is that, you know, when I've got an art problem, I call up the art director on Company of Heroes and say, help me out, help me make my game look better. So having mentors and support like that is invaluable, and it's really helped me level up really fast. I used to do everything. I was running the website, I was making the games, like I was programming and drawing, um, and of course like marketing, um, which I wasn't really doing any of, but um, now I've started hiring out the art first, and now I'm working with a web developer for a revenue share, but other than that, I still do mostly everything myself. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, as an indie, you do have to wear so many hats, including, you know, 
business development, um, you know, and uh, accounting as well. Mm -hmm. You know, don't forget all those all those things. And the tea boy, I make my own tea. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I've done mostly everything myself except for the art. I've always kind of outsourced the art because, you know, if you can get someone else to do it better, you, you probably shouldn't be doing it yourself. And also, it's just very time-consuming art, right? So, I, I always outsource that. And I outsource music, but I always do the sound effects myself. Um, and more recently, I've started doing helping other people as like a producer designer, because when you program a game, it takes so long. <laughs> and I always feel that I've got kind of more to offer to help other people um, whilst I can still make my game. So that's the kind of newest thing for me. Okay, thanks, guys. So, um, so the next up is is more than a hobby. Um, so I think that that you know we have a lot of people that come to the Vancouver Indie Meetup, and um, a lot of them are hobbyists, or they dabble, they make games that maybe they don't launch, um, but it's more for themselves. It's almost like a work of art. Uh, so taking this more than a hobby, I think there's some, some questions about, you know, how do you raise the money to do this? Um, how do you get distribution? Um, you know, sort of, how do we make this a business? And as a person who has uh, founded a couple businesses, um, I bootstrapped myself up uh, through Work for Hire, I've um, gotten investor funding before, um, and that was kind of on a bigger scale. But when you're sort of a, a one-person shop, um, you know, it's a little more grassroots. And so I'm interested in hearing um, from your guys' perspective, um, you know, in terms of, of funding uh, to start off with, um, how is it that you guys kind of uh, get your foundation and, and get enough money to do what you're doing? Um, any strategies that you can give to them? Because I think it's sort of a daunting thing, like, how do I quit a day job and, and get to a point where I can fund myself? Um, I was really lucky because I got a really understanding job, like like very easygoing boss and stuff. So I had a full-time job at a lab, and I was making the games on the side, and it was kind of like a positive feedback loop. Like the more money I made from the site, I was just I didn't focus right away on squeezing money out of it. Like all my games are free. I was just really focusing on quality and just like kind of the theory, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, and just growing a foundation because I had the job, so I didn't have to like squeeze money out of it. And so slowly it worked. And as more people came and they made more money, I shifted to like part uh, like a bit of part time and then more part time. And then finally, in the end, I actually got laid off. But the timing was just right because um, well, because I remember he laid me off because I was like that girl that barely ever comes and just makes everyone test her games at lunch and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't much of an asset anymore. But um, yeah, so I just like shifted from job to website as, as I made more money. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I sold my house and put my life savings in the bank so I could support my family for at least two years with no income. But uh, I was talking with Andy Moore, who some of you might know from Steambirds last night, and uh, we both love the Flash portal market. Um, and Andy summed it up very simply. He said, you know, you've got bills at the end of the month. What other platform can you spend three weeks on a game sell it in the next week and pay your bills at the end of the month. And the Flash Portal market is the only space that works like that. Uh, and he was like very trumpeting it, and, and Greg from Congregate is like, stop telling people that. And I was like, yeah, tell them they have to make a good game in three weeks, and then they can sell it the next one. And that's really the key. You know, I, There's so many opportunities for distribution, platforms, everything like that. If you can make good games, you can make a living. Um, but I, you know, depending on your responsibilities, you know, I've got a, a family, so I had to put a big runway down. But uh, if you can make good games, um, I, I think the biggest advice is make a game before you quit. And you know, like with Ola, she made a lot of games. The quality got better. The revenue is there. If you make good games, you will make money. If you don't make good games, you won't make any money. And that's a really good time he said to go indie. Um, but uh, you know, it's there's really short revenue streams out there, and then there's longer ones. You know, quitting your job and spending three years making a game and hoping it sells is probably not the best plan. Hmm. But I know people that have done that and have made a lot of money. So I don't know if that can work for you. But they're in the minority at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, I can tell you how not to do it. <laughs> so um, when I first went indie, I just felt so compelled to go indie. I just went indie without any savings or anything, right? But uh, to make ends meet, I had to do IT consultancy. So I did like installing networks and getting rid of viruses and stuff. And that brought some money in whilst I made my first couple of games. And my first couple of games, they're five years old now or more. And they've made about two and a half thousand dollars each, which is really a failure, okay? But the point was, was I, ke I kept making games and each one got better and better until I was making enough money that I could tell my IT client, you know, hey, I'm not doing any more work for you anymore, sorry, because now I'm supporting myself. But I had to like juggle credit cards, juggle loans. M you know, my wife is a uh, part-time science writer. 
but we have to go through all sorts of kind of cash flow issues and things, and I've got kids and so on. It's very awkward. So anyway, I got the job at Big Fish, and obviously that's good, steady salary for a while, that was useful, and I managed to save up a bit of money, which was my runway to go Indy the second time, because I thought I'm not going to go Indy again with no money again, because that's pretty dumb. Um, so I saved up a runway, not a long runway, I only have got six months, I mean Vancouver's not cheap, having a family's not cheap, um, so I needed to, but it's a good incentive. I mean, this whole time I had no money, it was a good incentive to focus on uh, making games that actually will make money and getting them out the door and shipping them, basically. Not spending, you know, three years making an engine, another two years not finishing an MMO, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and casual games is a, a good way to do that because they didn't need too long to develop, you know, six months, and you get the money fairly quickly back from the game portals, and, and you know, you know fairly well if they are successful or not. So that's how I did it. Okay, thanks. Um, this kind of leads into the next question, which is, uh, what are the distribution and revenue opportunities? So, you know, um, you've made a good game. Uh, where do you put it? And I think the interesting thing about all three of you is that you kind of are each reaching out to different channels. Um, so hopefully that can give you guys uh, some ideas of where you could put a game once you put it. Okay, so as I said, I made casual games, and this is Casual Connect. And when I say casual games, I'm talking about Mac 3 games, card games, stuff like that, right? Um, and obviously, the casual game portals were where I made the money. I had my own website, but I only make about 1% of my revenue from my own website. 99% of it comes from uh, Big Fish Games, Real Arcade, uh, iWin, Oberon Media. You know, they're all here, lined up around there. Some of them are way better than other ones. I'll let you guess which is the best one. I think probably everyone knows. Um, and over the years, things have changed, like Reflective Arcade used to be pretty good, and then Amazon bought them, and I'm sorry to say that they're not such a good portal anymore. And, you know, you, you some of them make a thousand times more than the other ones, <laughs> you know, so you have to kind of pick and choose. So that, that was my model, casual game portals, worked really well. I'm changing it up this year because of mobile and making more indie games, so it, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a new realm for me with lots of different possibilities. Um, I've never tried to get any of my games sponsored. Like, it never even occurred to me that I didn't know you could do that, but I don't think I could have made much money that way anyway because dress up, like, as anyone I talk to, they say, like, oh, yeah, the, you'll, you'll get, like, 100 or 200 bucks maybe. Um, th I think the dress up, in, like, genre is just works a bit differently that way because it's all free and mass produced and um, nobody really takes it up seriously. So I'm essentially, I have my own portal. I have my own portal, so I make games for myself. Um, I make sure to have my logo in there, so like, and I encourage people to spread them um, and just try and drive traffic back to myself. Um, and that's worked out really well for me, because I, I, know, I know a few people like to try and do the whole sponsorship thing, and it's just like they're really at the mercy of, um, of the portals, and also they kind of live in game to game, whereas I actually like build a foundation with mm. the portal. Um, and I think a lot more people should consider doing it that way because I'm sure the portals make so much more money off the games than, than the people what they'll pay you for them. Plus, they'll, they'll keep making money like residually for forever from those games, whereas you get paid once and that's it. I so guess we, we, we should clarify. You're talking about like Flash oh portals. Sorry, Flash, where yeah, you yeah. Get Flash specifically, yeah. Where you get sponsorship once. Yeah. Uh, so the, what the portals I was dealing with, you know, you get a royalty and it yeah. every month. You know, and I get royalty five five years later from some of my games. So, casual portals and, and the flash ones. Yeah, sorry, flash I portals specifically. Um, I was going to ask, are you using uh, you know, like Google AdWords or what? Like oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. So on the website, I have um, Google Ads. So it's just like um, I get paid when people click on the ads and stuff. And uh, I'm. I'm a big supporter of making games for the Flash portals and taking your sponsorship dollars and using their exposure to drive people to your brands and build up your brands and create experiences around them. Um, so, you know, my, my tactic is make a game, get it out in front of as many eyeballs as possible and start to build that um, perspective. But to be fair, every time I talk to Ola and she's talking about, you know, the customer service side of things, it's like, you get my email, she's like, my inbox is insane. And it's because she runs her own portal, and uh, that's just not something I'm interested in creatively. I'd rather focus on the craft of making games. And so for me, the portals make that a very easy revenue stream. Yes, you only get paid once, and then you get like a literally minuscule amount of money um, from ads. You know, with 
2.4, 2.3 million plays, I think I've made 500, $600 off ads. And that's from one of the higher CPM ad servers in uh, the Flash space. So it's not a tremendous amount of money from ads. The real money is in your primary license. And then what you'll do is, depending on the success of the game and the quality, you'll get a few additional licenses. So they'll send you an email, say, hey, can you make me an exclusive version that doesn't have your sponsor's link in it? So for me, it says, take out the Armor Games link take out your links and give me a bear version for my portal and they still pay me 500 bucks for that and it takes 20 minutes to do. So that's a, a lucrative post-sponsorship thing that, that still happens. I'll still get emails every month or so when the game was done almost a year ago. So it, it comes in handy every once in a while. I actually thought of some more things, Mark, sorry. <laughs> so as well as making casual games, the other thing I did was some contract work for Big Fish Games. And uh, y you know, because I'd made some good games before, they gave me a very good deal. and. Pretty much everyone I know who works with them <laughs> gets good deals and is happy, you know, working as a third-party developer with them. So that's another option, isn't Mindy? You can do contract work, and you know, it can it can work out very well indeed. Um, the only thing is, y y you're not building your own IP if you do that, and you're not building your own customer uh, database. So really, this year, my focus is building my own brand and getting customers to my site and building a mailing list. I've already got some, but you know, because um, a hell of a lot of people have played my games, but it's on the portals, so I don't have any of their email addresses, they don't visit my site, and I need to sort of bring that audience back, so I've kind of got the, the control there, uh, and can use that customer base. So that's really, really my focus, and I know some people that do that very successfully. And the other thing I made money from was selling uh, gambling links on my website. So you know, you get these offers through where they say, I'm gonna pay you to put a text link on your website. So I did that, and I made like maybe six thousand dollars from just these very easy work to just stick a text link on your website and so on. Now you might have a moral issue with that, um, and also Google don't really like that, so they sort of slap your page rank, is what it's called. <laughs> they lower your sort of site in the rankings. So, so now this year I'm letting all of those links expire and making the site clean again, and so I'm actually building it up as, as my own sort of revenue center. Yeah, I've had offers for those a few times, but I mean, it's a site for kids, so I just don't, I didn't touch it. <laughs> Plus, it made me feel dirty. <laughs> yeah, this is like bingo sites and things like that, so it worked for me. So as, as an extension of that question, um, without necessarily giving us, you know, the, the numbers that you're making, I'm kind of interested in hearing what ranges um, you could expect from each of these channels. You know, so we have the casual games portals, we have your own portal with ads, and we have, uh, you know, a game sponsorship model. So what sort of ranges should people look at um, just so they can kind of do the math themselves and figure out which way they might want to go? Uh, so in the Flash space, um, depending on the quality of the game, your originality and your reputation as a developer, um, probably your first game, if, if it's extremely good, it'll get between five and $10,000. Um, as you build a reputation and you start to build contacts within all the portals, um, that can go up a little bit. Um, a really good, solid Flash game can consistently get between 10 and 15 once you have you're established in the space. Uh, the true exceptions are th to the norm are things like Steam Birds, which I think is, is cleared. And Andy's posted this in his presentations himself. Uh, you know, 70 to 80 thousand over their lifetime, which to date I think is a year and a half. So that's pretty good for you know one man for two months making a game. Um, but the the common range is between five to 15, depending on quality. Um, with your own website, like with ad, just ads on the website, I mean, you're really just limited by your traffic. The more traffic you have, the more you make. So, actually, I found that if you uh, use those like online automatic calculators, like if you just Google a URL, like somewhere down the list, they'll pop up like little generated auto info about the website and they estimate their income. And I've found those to be um, like in the ballpark, actually, like for my site. So, I, if you want an idea, just Google the URL and then look at one of those, and it will be in the range. I mean, I was calculating just like playing on Alexa, comparing my traffic, and some of these dress-up portals make like tens of thousands of dollars per day, so it's, you know, really, it, you can basically make a ton of money if you're, if you're just good at what you do. So, so with casual games, like I said, my first couple of games, I only made a couple of thousand dollars over like five years. So, you know, that's the bottom of the barrel. I've got a kind of load of mid-range games where I only invested about two and a half, three thousand dollars in the art assets and music, and over their lifetime they've made like forty thousand dollars back. So that's pretty good, and they didn't take me long to make, um, and they keep making money. But that that's four years worth of sales, 
you know, at, at first you make it, you, you, you just make your money back and a bit of profit, but you, ha you have to be in it for the long game, really. Um, I can't really talk about the, m the money I made from the, the, the contract work, just for, you know, NDA type reasons. Um, but that was pretty good also. But I, I, I actually keep a log of, um, I'm very anal, and I keep a list of like, uh, the amount of hours I spend on each project and the profit from each project. And the, the what was a good revelation this year was the, the work that I, got, that, I got, that I got the least amount of money for per hour was as an employee. The second worst was doing contract work. The next one was making my own IP. And the best work was working as a consultant on projects. Like if it, people have got casual games that they want to bring to market, I can help them say, okay, you need to add a meta game, you need to improve this thing or that thing. And that's, that's worked out very nicely. So I'm doing more of that this year, helping people get their game to a marketable quality in the casual realm. So it's an inter and when you're an employee, of course, you, what you earn is fixed, that's it. You can get good money, but it's fixed, and you never get any more. But my IP, I can reuse, it keeps, us, uh, keeps on earning money, right? So that's the really fascinating thing about running your own business. Okay, thank you. The, the next one is sustainability. So, um, y you know, these are, uh, you know, what you could make on an individual game, et cetera, but um, as a person who uh, runs a company, it's always, you know, how do you, how do you make this sustainable in the long haul? Um, so, and I guess, you know, like, you know, you guys will figure this out as you go, but, you know, I'm kind of curious what ideas that you have to, you know, continue this, to grow your business, and to make it something that could last five, ten years or, or longer, rather than just, you know, what you've done this year. I'll go first. Um, I think for me, it's the ability to be flexible and look at opportunities, um, and being able to really change direction quickly. Um, the other thing that I'm trying to do is uh, I switched from Flash to Unity, um, and it was a very easy decision once Unity announced it was going to be exporting to Flash in the future. Um, but that's so that, like right now, as we all know, the game industry is crazy. You know, there's you know, gold rushes every two months where, you know, something that somebody was laughing at a year ago is somebody else is making $100 million a month on. So it's a very quick and changing industry, and as an independent person, I want a tool set um, and a game, the types of games that I make, to be flexible within that. Um, most of my games, with a, with a company called Ninja Robot Dinosaur, as you can guess, most of my games are for nerds, and they're, uh, the term I've learned now this week is mid-core. I make mid-core games. Um, but to be flexible and to be able to ride the wave of the industry because um, you know, I grew up in the industry where putting a game in a box on a shelf was the only way to make money, and I still talk to people who are in that space who don't see what's happening here and don't see the opportunities to reach a whole new audience um, because they're still stuck in that box. And my, my goal to maintain financial stability is quality and flexibility. Good games and wherever the audience is. Um, for me, reputation is super important. Like, um, I interact a lot with my fans and I take everything they say very seriously. And as soon as like I, I tried like one type of ad, and right away people were like, "Oh, I used to like the site, but now it's too commercialized," you know. And I'm like, "Oh, sorry, I'll take that off." And they were like, "Oh my God, I can't believe you're talking to me." <laughs> so you know, I, I just like I feel like they're my friends because they allow me to do what I love for a living. So like I, you know, I, I try to treat these people well. Plus, I'm just I guess I'm very sensitive to what people say. So, but that that's part of my long-term strategy: just quality, reputation, you know, uh, building up trust, making sure that like. If people come to my site, they think this is great. I'm going to show this to my friends because, and that's sort of been my strategy from day one. I've always been thinking like in the long, long run, not not tomorrow. Um, and then, because like, you know, eventually I would like to move into maybe like more complex games, not just like dress-up games and and you know, movies and theme parks and toys. But that's <laughs> so I'm just I'm just building a, a good reputation for now. So I, I could actually continue to make casual games like I do as a kind of uh, one-person shop outsourcing art and music, and I could probably have a sustainable income doing that, but I know what I'm doing now. Um, or I could try to kind of level up to the point where I'm getting um, investment to spend $100,000 making a, you know, a hidden object game, and th then I would make more return, hopefully, it doesn't always happen. So, you know, you can make quite a lot of money from casual games, but it does take a lot more I initial input into the art quality and stuff like that. 
So I could keep doing that, but actually this year I've decided to kind of mix things up a bit and, and go with cross-platform more indie games. So, you know, that might be something innovative or it might be a platform or a shooter or an RPG, something like that. Um, or the mid-core games, you know, everyone keeps saying mid-core all the time. And that, that works for me because I think casual games um, have brought a lot to the game industry in terms of usability and accessibility and, uh, you know, the kind of um, tutorials and addiction curve and all this kind of stuff, right? And I would like to bring that to games, to these mid-core games. So that's really going to be my strategy this year. And I don't know if it's going to work. Um, so there's a big risk there. Uh, and if it fails, I'll go back and make casual games. I know I can kind of keep keep banging those out. Sounds like a common theme, you know. Um, if you're doing something risky, make sure you're covered. Mm. I think that's you know really really important. Um, just a lot of people uh, kind of have that idealistic concept: do something and then launch it, and it'll do really awesome. And then there's no plan B, and then well, they're back where they were uh, before they started, and not so happy about it. Uh, okay, so the the last set of questions here are. Um, you know, what are some common indie developer challenges? And I kind of want to really open this up. I mean, you know, we've, we've all talked before about, you know, quality of life issues and, and just different things. How do you organize yourself? And, you know, so it's sort of like, what kind of things can people expect who haven't really kind of sat in a chair and worked at home and kept themselves on schedule and all these things? And, um, and, and what do you do to, like, help get through these? Or, or what do you hope to be able to do if, if you're not getting through them yet? Well, I, I think probably the, the two biggest challenges that I see most indie developers face is uh, marketing and business. Um, they really approach it from, I'm going to make this awesome game, and I'm going to make a ton of cash, and the game's done, and not one single blog has written an article about them. And I'll talk, and it's like, well, did you, did you, have you talked to the press? Well, I, I, I mailed out a press release to IndieGamer.com. It's like, okay, well, they put you up. Anybody else? No. And it's like, if you look at most successful game publishers, you know, between 40 and 50% of their budget goes to PR and marketing. And as an indie developer, you are a business to yourself. And I struggle with this too, you know? So I'm, I'm lucky if I spend 25% of my time on marketing and, and the business side of things. But you really have to approach it from that standpoint because um, if you want to make art games, make art games in your spare time and do that and have a wonderful, happy life. But if you want to make a living at it, you have to approach it as a business. And what that means is, you know, being really flexible with your time, being able to, you know, put your ass in the chair and get your work done. It's just uh, what they always say about writers is you got to be able to get in there and do the work. But it's not just programming, art, and game design. You have to be able to run a business and, and have an education about that. The good thing is it's not hard to get an education like with that. It's not hard to find mentors who can provide you with that input. Um, the indie community, if you look at the real success stories in the indie scene, all of them have done a great job at doing PR. For example, uh, Brian Provinciano is a friend of ours who's working on Retro City Rampage, which is coming out this summer. And uh, he's just done a great job, not only of making a game as a one-man army, um, but he's done a great job of promoting it. You know, he's gotten you know, five-page spreads in Edge Magazine and tons and tons of blog features, and he's won tons of contests. He was at PAX last year as one of the PAX 10. Um, his, the awareness on his game as a one-man game is incredible, but he spends a lot of time on that. So it's, I think that's the most common one, is just business and marketing. And when you're planning out your schedule and your time, when you're thinking about your time on programming or art, think about your time on marketing and promotion, because it's a business, and you got to make sure that people know about your game. Actually, I, I totally agree with Shane, but I also want to add something else. Shane's making an assumption here, which is that you can finish your game. I told you I'd flip a table if you argue with yeah, me. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there's an assumption there that you can finish your game. And sadly, the reality is a lot of people never finish their first game because, you know, the old cliche, that last 10% is 90% of the work. And it, and it really is. And finishing a game, you know, great, I've got this game, it plays well, sure. Now you've got to add in all the, all the GUI, right? all the whole front end. You've got to, and then you've got to make sure it works on Windows and Mac. And, You've got to do special builds. And there's this really kind of boring slog at the end, and then polishing, testing, reiterating on that stuff. Um, so finishing a game is maybe one of the biggest challenges Shipping. people face. And, and, and to do that, you, you've got to watch your scope. You know, I mean, I know uh, we're friends with Alex Vostroff, and he, he wanted to do a three-month game, and it's taken him 12 months, right? And that's the typical story you hear. Yeah, this three-month thing. And then it balloons into 12 months. And, and it still is shipped a, 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 I say beta, you say beta. He shipped a, a beta version. Um, and it, it's, you know, he still needs to ship the actual final version. 
So finishing a game and having that kind of grind, same as in AAA, you've got to kind of crunch and grind and get that game out. That's really the biggest thing. And once you've done it once, you know what to expect. But it, it's still, uh, each time is tough. Yeah. And something Jake and I have talked about a lot um, is you never think about it, but you know, finaling a game is extremely hard. I've, you know, I've, I've shipped you know, close to 20 titles in my career, and at the end of every game, you need rejuvenation time. Mm. As an indie, nobody's doing your customer, su customer support during that time. Nobody else is getting your game on the portals. So after you ship, you don't just get to go on a vacation on a beach for a month. You know, you've got to keep running the business. And I was amazed by how drained I was after shipping my first game as an indie. Because mm. even as a producer where you're in charge of all that stuff while everyone else is on vacation, you can still kind of hand it off to a couple people in the studio. You've got a, a, a company environment to hand that stuff off. As an indie, you're it. So there is no vacation at the end of the game to recharge. So your downtime, you know, I found I couldn't really sit in front of the computer and start working again for almost two months after finaling, just because it was so draining and there were so many other demands. I could never completely disconnect. And that was a really, really big surprise. And, and you found it too after yeah. shipping your last yeah, game. Yeah, my last game, I mean, I was crunching like crazy to get it done. I was doing like 85 hour weeks at the end. And those 85 hours weren't sitting at a computer going on Facebook. They were like <laughs> finishing the game, right? And after that, yeah, I was, I was drained for a long time. And so, you know, I, th I think, oh, maybe it would be great if I could ship four or five casual games a year. But uh, I just don't think I could actually sustain that pace and sort of stay sane, because you, you do need that downtime. And you're supposed to be doing stuff in that downtime, like marketing and support and shipping builds. Um, earlier, Shane mentioned getting a mentor. I tried that once. I, I sought a mentor, and then she tried to buy out my company, so I, <laughs> I stopped <laughs> seeking mentors. <laughs> um, and actually, most things I have problems with, I just I found that I just Google it. Business, can I write this off my taxes? I Google it. You know, how do I fix this coding problem? I, I Google it. So I, I don't know. I, I've been able to do a lot more that way. Um, the only problem with me is um, was my sleep schedule is horrendous because mm. I have no willpower and it's just like if I didn't have a dog that to walk in the morning, I would be like my schedule would just be totally like there would be no correlation between sleep and, and nighttime. Um, but now I found melatonin, which is great. So I, I just <laughs> at some hour of the night I decide, okay, no, I should really go to sleep. I pop melatonin, I go to bed, and that's actually really helped me. I have to say that's the most creative um, suggestion I've heard out of him. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> um, well, you know, okay, any other thoughts on balance? I know uh, some people have talked about, you know, how to kind of, you don't go to an office and so things feel a bit different. Um, so maybe you guys could talk a little bit about that. Um, so for me, um, my family was a very important part of the decision to go independent. I, I have a wonderful daughter and uh, spending time with her is vitally important. Um, so a big, big rule that we set up shortly after um, I started working from home is that if I'm in my office and the door is open, you can come visit daddy. If the door is closed, I don't care if it's lunchtime, I don't care if it's supper time, I don't care if you know it's the kiss before bed, the door is closed, I'm at work, I'm not to be disturbed. And you know, I generally work with the door open, but if I'm involved in a really important problem and I really need to focus, I'll just close it. Um, and just setting up those little rules around the house to allow you to focus and set up the time um, because that work-life balance is really important to me and you know I spend half a day of every day with my daughter um, and when I'm with her I'm with her but when I'm with my my game and working on my game or working with my consulting clients that's what I'm doing and I'm working and it's it's a very black and white rule that we have in our house and I found that after we put that in being able to focus is really good um, another thing that I've done um, and this is because you know most of my career I've been a project manager I am a scrum consultant I'm a big supporter of agile and, and scrum methodologies and uh, I built a scrum of one backlog every week I plan out my work I estimate my work every at the end of every week I track my velocity and how much work I get done um, and putting that very simple project management umbrella under myself has really allowed me to get going and I often find that I over-organize myself, but I go to a lot of weekend game jams, like 48-hour game jams, and I always have the to-do list on the wall, and I'm always editing it and changing it, and a lot of the other developers will come up and be like, wow, you're really organized. But at the end of the jam, uh, you know, my game is gonna be pretty close to done, it might suck, but at least it's done where other people's, it's not working at all. And uh, that little extra bit of organization, it's 
20 minutes of time in a week, but it keeps me focused. It, it keeps me focused on my deadlines, what my priorities are, and uh, it's been a really, really huge help. It's all, and all it is is a Google Docs spreadsheet, but it's open on my laptop all the time. It's open on my phone all the time. It's open on my PC all the time. So if I'm working, it, it's there, and it's, it's a lifeline. If I didn't have the one-man scrum, I'd still be working on Rare right now. It never would have got done. Um, I set up, I, I love working from home, and I set up like a really sweet office for myself. I painted the walls, and I put up, this, the theme is Whistler, and uh, I put up full wood beans. There's an elk skin and, and maps and stuff. Well, the maps aren't Whistler, it's just me. But uh, <laughs> I have no idea if that helps, but I, I don't know. I just love coming downstairs, and it's like, ah, my office. And then I go on Facebook and waste a lot of time, but <laughs> that's just what I did. I don't know if it's helping. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked crazy times, and then I just have the down times, I guess. You know, um, so I, I kind of do the crunching, and then I have times where I'm not really doing much work at all, and then I go outside when it's nice or spend time with my kids. I, I, I guess, actually, after my last game, I've promised not to set myself such crazy deadlines. The problem is the last game was a spring, it was a, an Easter-themed game, right? So I couldn't call up the Pope and say, can you move Easter, maybe a month? Um, I have my game's not ready. And like two of my other games were Christmas games. So every time I set myself these crazy deadlines, I, I get the game shipped, but I kind of, you know, drive myself mad doing it. So I'm going to try an experiment which is a more kind of, you know, casual deadline so that I don't have to do the crunching. But I do definitely make sure I can see my kids. In fact, most of the work I get done is more at night, actually, you know, I program into the early hours of the morning. When I finished my last game, I I programmed all the way through until like 9 a.m. just on the day I was shipping it. Got one hour sleep, got up and <laughs> carried on. So that's the kind of thing you have to do sometimes. Yeah, I also have a really solid rule of no Gmail, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, my phone is not in the room when I'm working. Mm. I'll leave it in the hallway. So if somebody sends me a text message, I'll get to it. But there's, I, I try and set aside like a four to five hour chunk every day that I work where I'm not reachable and not distractible. And if I need to have a break to go have a coffee, that's when I check my email. And I don't even use Facebook on the PC anymore. It's all on my phone because if I'm sitting at a laptop or a computer, I'm usually working. And that, that is another one that saved my bacon because otherwise I'd have, you know, I'd have a thousand friends, but I wouldn't have a game done. Yeah, actually, that's why my sleep schedule is so upside down is because nighttime is the only time that people don't bother you. Mm -hmm. Like, it, there's a really good oatmeal uh, comic about working from home, and it's exactly like that comic. Like, and everybody knows that you're working from home, so if anyone else has, like, happens to have a day off on a Tuesday and they need someone, like, who do you think they're going to call, right? So <laughs> but you can't even stop that. Chevy Ray Johnson showed up on my doorstep one day. Just like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, I'm working. He's like, can I come in and have coffee? I'm like, yeah, sure, what the hell, you know? So you, you can't even, if they know where you live, <laughs> they'll, they'll get yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting, actually. When I first started my company, and, and it was so tempting to go sit on the couch or go to the fridge and get a snack and just get distracted really easily. And I was reading this, um, these tips on being a writer, which, you know, sort of being an independent artist, I can't think kind of relates to everyone. And I, I remember this one that was kind of funny where the person dressed up, um, got their briefcase, walked around the block, and then uh, came back in and sat down and started working. And it was just their way of kind of feeling like they had made a change between you know, wearing slippers and, and eating breakfast and actually going to work uh, to be productive. Um, and they needed that uh, in order to be productive. So sometimes you know, these things seem silly, but you know, when you give Indy a shot and you're sitting there you know, stuck uh, creative block and you want to go do something else, sometimes forming these divisions in your life ends up being very, very helpful. And, and in fact, you know, I know some indies that have decided they can't get work done at home for various reasons, so they actually get themselves an office and they go to an office and do it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think basically it's different for different people, right? Some people can work at home, and I can do that, but I'm not the kind of guy that, like, works on a schedule, literally. Uh, you know, if I feel like uh, doing a whole bunch of work today, I'll do it, and other days I might feel like doing none, and I actually allow myself to do that because I know that overall, my balance is, it, it tends towards the work. Yeah? So instead of tending towards doing absolutely nothing and shipping nothing, uh, hopefully you tend towards you know, shipping something. But you're gonna just have to find out what you're like. Are you disciplined enough at home? If not, get an office um, you know, or set up some kind of routine. It's different for different people. Okay, thanks guys. So I'm um, gonna open this up to you guys. Um, so want to uh, see if there's any questions. Um,
Hello? Huh? Okay. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Sean, uh, Chinstrap Games. Um, there we go. I just left Microsoft six months ago to become an indie mobile game developer. Uh, so I'm about to release my first title on iOS. Um, and it's very interesting to me that none of you are on mobile right now. And I'm wondering, is it because you think you just cannot make a living on iOS, that it is far too late, or is it merely a question of skill set? Uh, so for me, this is a big reason why I switched to Unity, is so that I can take a game and I can put it on multiple platforms, and iOS is a part of my strategy going forward. Um, a big thing that I, I changed in my strategy a couple months ago is that if and when I do release a mobile game, I'm going with a publisher. I'm not going to self-publish. I will give them 60% of the pie, 50% of whatever Apple doesn't take. Uh, just because they're going to get in front of more eyeballs. It, it takes it from a lottery to playing poker, you know, and right now it's a lottery if you self-publish. And uh, I know people who have made some really, really beautiful games, like great games, and when I ask them about their revenue, they're like, uh, I just don't want to talk about it, you know. So uh, the only advice I have on going iOS on an indie is feel free to give a lot of your pie away to get somebody that will get you eyeballs because that's what you need to succeed on mobile. It's just too hard to stick out. Um, I definitely want to go mobile, and I know I should, and I, I, I'm very lucky because my genre isn't, I feel, saturated with quality, so I, I think I could do well. I just, I have a to-do list of like five billion things, and that's, that's one of the many that, that's on it, but I, I definitely want to and plan to. So I have an iPad game in my bag that I'm showing to Big Fish Games today, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going mobile too. Um, probably could have done it sooner, well, I was an employee until January at Big Fish Games, so. Um, so uh, mobile is definitely on my radar, cross-platform is really. So, so uh, yeah. PC, Mac, m multiple different mobile. Um, also uh, web versions to drive traffic to the download versions and to, to, to promote the mobile ones. So for casual games, that's why I'm going to Big Fish Games because uh, I'm going to talk to them and to other casual publishers because um, they can get the eyeballs for casual games. For like indie games, Again, there are publishers out there, Chilingo and all sorts of other people that, that can do a really good job of that. Probably I will try it myself first, just to like learn, like, is it going to work? And you know, yeah. you hear a lot of people trying it themselves and they fail kind of miserably. I've g gained a lot of information about good strategies that I might try <laughs> and see if they work for me. Things like once you have a mailing list, of course, you can hit up everyone on your mailing list and say, the game is out now. You, you can drive traffic to it from a, a, a web version. Uh, you get the press release coming out at the same time. If you have other games, you can drive them to it from your other game. You update it with a... So if you can get everything out at once, then hopefully that's enough to push you up in the charts, right? Yeah. So Noah Lopez, has said, uh, Snappy Touch, mm. has said, uh, I think has gone on the record, that he doesn't believe that publishers offer any value to indies. Uh, you think he just got really lucky with Casey's contraptions? Mm. Um, you, you really feel you need a, a publisher to get you out there? Oh, I, I think Big Fish's presentation the other day about how they use the network effect and set up each of their games as splash screen as a way to promote new games. Um, man, if every publisher on mobile is not demanding that of their developers in the next six months, I'll be really surprised because it, it's a game changer. It takes your entire install base and turns them into potential customers for renewable product and you can also promote launches. It, it's the most amazing tool and it's something that I'm really excited about. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, Dan Cook from LostGarden.com and Thryfox, uh, I think it was about two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, he coined the term of being an octopus and not putting all your eggs in one basket, but making a really entertaining and fulfilling experience and putting it on the platforms where it makes sense and where you can monetize. And that's definitely a very big part of my strategy and a big reason why I choose Unity is it lets me be an octopus and it gives me flexibility to go to where the eyeballs and the customers are. And, and you, you know earlier I said I wanted to build my brand this year and control the customers and stuff. That's why I don't want to use a publisher for future games. For, for casual games, that's fine. Someone else has got a bigger, bigger audience, but I want to be able to collect the emails and build the brand for the indie games myself and control that and try it. I want to try it and see how it goes. If it fails, then okay, I may have to seek a publisher out. Um, one other quick question. I would just love to know how you validate your game ideas because you can't afford a lot of failures. You just make the games that you think are fun. I mean, for you guys doing multiple titles, you just make what you want to make and hope it works or do you spend a lot of time in prototyping and play testing and do you ever walk away from a game idea halfway through? 
usually I don't make it to halfway before I walk away, sure. but um, I have a great circle of friends. I also, uh, Jake and I have a little group of people that get together once a month and we play early prototypes with each other and give each other feedback. Um, my favorite part about Unity is even if it's not a Unity tar or an iPhone targeted game, I'll put it on my phone and I'll just go to a party or like an indie meetup and I just put it in people's hands and just watch them play. Um, it's the traditional game development mentality, and I know I'm not talking to people, a lot of people from that scene here, but it's to lock yourself in a box and make something wonderful and release it and hope they like it. But between web analytics, web metrics, and being able to put your game on your phone and sticking it in people's hands, uh, there's no value as an independent developer for me to keep my game idea secret. The most value I have is talking mm -hmm. to my peers, talking to my friends, getting their feedback, and seeing how they interact with my game to make it a better game. So from the day I have a box jumping over a box on Unity, it's in other people's hands, and I'm getting feedback. And that's been probably one of the best decisions I've made in terms of game quality. So if they're like, it's not fun when it's boxes, it's not gonna be fun when it's really pretty boxes. I'm really lucky because having my own portal, like I don't depend on every single game to be a success. So I kind of develop for myself, really. Like I make the game I wanna make, and if I figure if I like it, you know, odds are somebody else will like it, and at least I'll like it. So um, I just kind of make what I, what I like. Mm. Well, because I made casual games, and because I made match three games, for, for me it was a case of play all of the other ones and work out what's good about them and bad about them. So it's more of a scientific process, really, what's good and bad about them, make sure my game has the good points and a new theme and a few twists in there. And that was, that was really, that's what a lot of casual developers do, okay? But now I'm moving into the indie, I'm gonna follow what Shane says, which is I'm not be paranoid about people stealing my idea and testing early and testing often. So yeah, we're just about out of time. I'll just get you guys, the last two guys. And then. Okay. Um, hi, so as solo indies, we always have a lot to do and juggling lots of different hats. I'm kind of curious from your experience, what are the one or two things that just weren't worth your time to do that maybe you spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. that were you know, diminishing returns. I can speak to that for sure. So I'm afraid that Xbox Live Indie Games was not worth doing. Real shame because um, the X and A is really nice and programming for a platform with a fixed frame rate and everything else. Very appealing idea to me who used to have a Commodore 64 and an Amiga and all that stuff. So e Xbox Live Indie Game was, was really bad and what was even worse was Windows Phone 7 like awful downloads, um, unfortunately. And it's, it's a shame, so those weren't worth doing. I said earlier that some game portals were way worse than others. I don't know if I should be talking about them, but um, some are definitely better than others, and, and you just need to ask people, hey, wh which are the best ones, and pick the best ones. You know, and stuff like, I did stuff like fax 40-page contracts off to Russia to some portals, and then they would never, never make me a single you know, like dollar. So. You just have to learn what is a waste of time and don't do it again. <laughs> yeah. And look at the skills that you want to develop. You know, For me, I, I really want to develop the art and programming side, and if I didn't, I would outsource it. Um, and, and look at you know, what the vision is for the game and who can help you fulfill that. And if it's a skill you don't have to get it to that point yourself, then you know, find somebody who can and, and be really smart about partnering up with, with good people. The only time waste I can think of is one time I had an ad on the site looking for artists, and I took in some people, I gave them a chance who I like were okay but weren't that good and then in the end like I didn't like it that much and I just like didn't even use it because it wasn't worth my time to make that game anymore. Um, so now I, I just, I, I, I seek out the artists, I don't let them come to me. Um, so yeah, that's, because I, I can gauge my own time but like paying someone else and then and not being worth it, that was the biggest waste. Okay, last question. Um, well, I, I hope it's okay. I wasn't going to specifically ask the question. I, I've been doing this indie business probably longer than most people, um, and I listened to what you said, and I agreed with what you said in a lot of cases, but there were a couple of points that were important to me that, uh, that weren't covered, and I thought I'd introduce them, and, and maybe somebody could comment on them. Um, I started out you know, doing contract work, and contract work, you know, you work very hard, and then the contract finishes, and then you have to go and find another contract. Unless you're really organized, you don't actually have the other contract ready when the other one's finished. Um, so then I thought to myself, well, you know, I'll go and write my own software, and that's how I started writing games, and then gradually you find that's making as much money as the contract work, and so you switch over, and that was very nice to describe. But what I did discover um, is it's very important to every now and then go and do some contract work, because um, you may do it for three months, but basically it's like three months of school, because you sit around with a whole lot of other people 
who know a lot of things and you talk to them and you exchange ideas and, and uh, it's a learning experience. You don't want to do it for too long, but every now and then you should take a contract break. Um, just, and it helps financially, of course. Um, the other thing is, is that when you're trying to think of new games, um, creativity is very important. And, and I always had this urge to try and do something that hadn't been done before. Um, that turns out to be um, A, difficult, and, and B, a very good idea. So um, I'm always looking around for something that some new technology that's come along allows me to do something that has never been done before. And if I do it first, um, that's going to be quite an interesting proposition. Yeah. Um, so how do you get to do these creative things? Um, and I discovered another thing, and that is when I have nothing to do, my brain starts being creative. If I'm panicking to get rush things out, so make sure that, you know, you, you, you talked about downtime. I mean, the real thing about downtime, after you've been down a certain amount of time, your brain starts humming. Yep. And, and what you want to look for is where is there a hole in the market? Yeah. And if you can get Do you guys you have any comments that you want to add to that? Well, yeah. I, I think the thing about the contract work, and I, I'm actively doing contract work, but uh, you know, Jake started up a full indie meetup group in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and that's on a monthly basis, we're all getting together. And this group is over 100 every single time. And that's not the only time we get together. So um, I think it, it's rare that a week goes by that I'm not talking to two mm -hmm. or three other indie developers, looking at their games, having them look at my games. And I think that provides me with that feedback and that right. pulse and looking at what's coming up that I would have gotten from consulting without that network. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I was going to say the same thing, that when you've got a very close-knit network of developers, you can exchange ideas, talk about designs, talk about business <coughs> strategies. That is education in itself and maybe, maybe negates the need to do contract work. It's an alternative. Yeah. And, and then creativity, I think it works different for everybody. And whatever, I think the key is finding what works for you and how that works. Because I know people are like, I have the best idea when I get really wasted, and then I go down and I <laughs> float in the ocean, and the salt gets into my nose. I'm like, sure, dude, whatever works for you. I just have a sticky note in my book. You know, so everybody's got their own way. And that's the thing, is like finding the way that works for you. OK, so we're out of time today. But uh, if anyone wants to come up after and chat with these guys, um, great sources of knowledge. I hope that. Um, they've given you guys some inspiration and some confidence if, if this is the, the path that you want to seek. And, and best of luck to everyone uh, going down that indie road. Thanks for coming today.